Well, I became Commodore the year that we christened the new club. And charter and bylaws and in its new facilities was designed 100% to be a racing yacht club. We did not want and discouraged tremendously any power boats whatsoever, although we eventually had two or three power boats in the basin. And we wanted it to be a racing club. I had never raced in my life, never raced, I'd never seen a boat in my life, but I took to it very rapidly and I enjoyed it very much. I grew up in the Dust Bowl in North Texas and I'd never even seen a sailboat, <laughs> never mind sailed one. I'd never even seen a body of water until I moved up to, uh, got married and 67 years ago and moved to Westport with, where my wife had been since she was a little girl. And she had sailed back in the 30s with her parents out of Westport. She loved sailing. And so we moved there in 1950. And one of the, after a year or so, she decided she would like to go sailing. So we drove down to Sears Roebuck, as we call it in those days. And we bought an Indian Scout, which was 13 feet long. We tied it on top of our car, drove down to the Campo Basin and launched it. And she proceeded to teach me how to sail the little rascal. <laughs> so we sailed that for a while. And then she decided we needed bigger and better things. So someplace we saw an ad for a Casey Ketch, which was built in 1935 and was 41 feet long, made out of wood with cotton sails and a humongous cotton spinnaker, which nobody could have sailed. And Banny Sprague, one of our more knowledgeable sailors, volunteered to go up to Paytonera, Massachusetts, where the boat was moored, and sail back with us. Well, he, my wife Liz and I, the three of us sailed back from there. To put it more precisely, I lay in the bottom of the boat totally seasick the whole trip, and I don't think there was a wave more than a foot high, and, and they sailed the boat back. And we got it, and we anchored it in the basin, the old Campo Basin, and we had many an enjoyable cruise on it, but it soon got much too much to maintain, and so we sold it to another member of our club, Bob Curtis, and he kept it for some time, and we went on to buy uh, another cruising boat, and we enjoyed sailing for years. And, and eventually we decided that the kids came along and they started sailing Blue Jays. And I decided Liz and I wanted to race Lightning. So we bought an old wooden Lightning, which was in about as bad a shape as the Casey Ketch had been. And we vied every summer, every race with Wally Lineberg. No, not Wally Lineberg. Uh, I forgot his last name to see who could come in last. We didn't have any pretension to be able to come in first in any race, but it was a moral victory if we beat the other one. And so finally, one bright day, Ted Fontaloo, who was an extremely good sailor, decided he wanted to race lightnings. He didn't have a boat at the time, and he hooked up with a fellow that had designed, uh, drawn plans for building a lightning. So he, Larry Brundred, and I decided we would, one summer, that we would build three lightnings, which we promptly proceeded to do with Ted being the guru that knew how to do everything and my principal job being to make sure all the screw heads were aligned fore and aft and not crosswise and took care of the uh, various and sundry menial tasks around the place. And, Ted did all the uh, technical work. And we built those three boats with Ted leaving in midstream, being transferred to Atlanta, and Bob Shaler took his place. We built those three boats over the winter, started Labor Day and launched them on the 4th of July. They were built, uh, we built them absolutely from scratch. The cedar planks that we built them out of still had the bark on them when we took them down to the mill to have them planed down. We even built the mast out of 28 foot strips of spruce with not a single screw in them. They were glued together with resorcinol glue. The entire operation taking place in Larry Brundridge's garage and his 
playroom downstairs with his saintly wife cleaning up after us after every episode. And we finally got the things put together. We, with great trepidation, asked the official lightning measurer to measure them. They had to weigh at least 700 pounds, and they had to meet the various length and width and breadth uh, criteria. Every one of which they met, the bolts weighed 702, 704, and 705. We were absolutely delighted. Even the centerboards that we had built, cut out of sheep, big hunks of steel, measured in properly. So we were extremely gratified, and we went out to race that 4th of July weekend, and everything continued on from that point on. I eventually owned as many as five or six cruising boats. I swore I would never sell that Lightning, but when the fiberglass Lightnings came in, it was hopelessly outclassed. So I did finally sell it and reverted to racing cruising boats after that, and I had five or six of them, a CNC 35, a Morgan 41, Rhodes Reliant 38, winding up with an uh, Alden 44, which was just an absolutely gorgeous boat that we had enormous amount of fun racing. I can't emphasize enough, the club is a racing yacht club. It is not a power uh, fleet. It is not a social fleet. I guess we had an occasional dance on occasion, but it was yeah. very rare. Uh, and we never had a dining room. We never had a kitchen. We had buffets and outdoor grills and that sort of stuff occasionally. But the Commodore's job was relatively easy after we got the bu club built because we had so many fantastically talented members. And the club was organized by fleets. At that time, I think we had the Snipes, Lightnings and the queen of the fleet, the 30-foot Atlantics, and f fairly soon after that, the Thistle fleet. Those are our four main fleets, with Blue Jays being the predominant uh, sailboat for the uh, younger members of the... the Blue Jays were basically a baby lightning. And fortunately, we had in people like Ted Fontaloo and Banny Sprague and Joe Olson and that group very knowledgeable, Wally Cox, you remember Wally Cox, uh, I'm sure, he was an official lightning measurer, and they were all very experienced and very good at organizing these fleets into racing fleets. And I sort of stayed out of the way as Commodore and let them r run things, which they did extremely well. Going on till a few years ago, Cedar Point won the prize as the best racing yacht club in the United States. That was formerly held by clubs like Noroton, Larchmont, San Francisco, and we were extremely proud of ourselves because we do run extremely good regattas. We're not distracted by anything else. We started when we built the club, they got ready to build a clubhouse. Being, I never learned to drink, so I didn't know why anybody needed a bar, but somebody convinced me yacht clubs needed a bar, so we put a small little bar in. And we didn't want a dining room because A, we couldn't afford it, and B, we didn't think we should waste our time socializing, we should be out racing. So we finally built the yacht club. And the bar had little cubby holes behind it where if you wanted to bring a six pack of beer or a bottle of scotch or something, you could. But we never had bartenders, we never had anything else. My most ignominious feat was taking, going out for sale on my Lightning one day with Benny Sprague and another veteran sailor agreeing to crew for me in this race. And he said, Gay, are you bringing the beer? And I said, well, I hadn't thought of that. So I did, and I brought a whole uh, six pack of beer. That lasted just about to the starting line. They, where's the rest of it? I said, well, that's all I brought. And so I practically had a mutiny on my hands at that stage, but that, it, it turned out the best. I think it's been great for all of our children because they have always had a great junior program there. And we raised some extremely talented children that not only went on to become great, good racers in their own regard, but they were engaged in the summer in a wholesome sport. They were good, and they, were, they enjoyed it. They, they participated very strongly. We had somebody, Linda Jagger was one of the girls that beat all the men one year. She was a champion. We didn't discriminate, and it's... Uh, 
I remember Linda Blair, who went on to become a famous movie star in various nefarious films. She used to crew for my son. I forgot two stories that might be of interest. Uh, one, when George Morris was trying to sell the lots, we priced the ones along the waterfront at $22,500 a piece. They were half acre lots. And uh, he was having trouble selling them. And one day a Broadway actor named Edward Mulher, I think was his name, came along and bought the three lots closest to the yacht club, but he would only pay $60,000 for them instead of 60, six, 60, 750, which we, was the list price. So we finally negotiated them up to 62.5, and he bought all three of them. That's how hard they were to sell. I subsequently bought, my wife and I subsequently bought the two lots closest to the yacht club for a one acre, and we built our house. I think we had the first, no, the second, we had the second house on there, uh, uh, on the, of the seven that were eventually built. And we paid the 22.5 for one of them, and 35,000 from the other one when we bought it from Mule Hare. I think the, I remember one lot subsequently sold for $500,000. We eventually sold our house for over $2 million, which it cost us three or $400,000 to build. And I think the lots now are selling for over a million dollars a piece down there. Oh yeah, absolutely. It's incredible, incredible appreciation. And they're really not good lots. They're, we were extraordinarily lucky. They're, we've had two northeasters or hurricanes, what do you want to call them, and the, the beach stayed exactly there. It did not wash away where those seven lots that we'd built there stayed right where they were. The only place we had any damage was on the other side of the yacht club by the channel where it comes in. That washed away over there. They had to repair that. The other story I remember is that famous old Casey catch I had back from my first boat. We sailed it down in front of the Campo Beach to watch the fireworks one night, one fourth of July. And I didn't know much more about sailing a boat than I did driving a dog sled. but. After the fireworks were over, I proceeded to come back into the basin, and I got turned around and ran it right ashore, right onto Campo Beach. And a wonderful fellow named Mac Jacoby, who was a member of the ah. Coast Guard, and a, you just can't imagine a saltier guy. He he had a heavy set power boat. He came and pulled me off the beach. I said, "Thank you, Captain." Proceeded out to go and ran right smack back onto the beach again. <laughs> So Mac came back, said, okay, gay, he pulled me off again. He came back out, I was started off again, and I hate to say this, but I ran aground the third time. Mac said, this is the last time I'm leaving here. <laughs> so he took me off again. We eventually found our way back. But he was a wonderful character in our yacht club in those days, wonderful guy.